Can you hear me now? Amen. I'm on. I'm hot. There's a lot of heat up here. It's a lot. There's a preacher who was teaching on temperance and he got to the end of his message and he started getting excited. And he said, if I had all the beer in the world, I'd throw it in a river. And he started getting some amens. And he said, if I had all the wine in the world, I'd throw it in the river. And he started getting claps and he got excited and he said, if I had all the whiskey in the world, I'd throw it in the river. And he went and sat down. Then the song leader comes up. And he says, we're going to close with a hymn, Shall We Gather at the River? (laughs) (laughs) Well, this morning, The message is about, do you have clean garments? I don't know if someone picked out the songs from this, but it's amazing we sang songs this morning that mentioned the garments. Are you washed in the blood? It's amazing how things come together. But we're going to be looking this morning at Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. And if you don't know for sure, it's right towards the end of the New Old Testament, right before Malachi sandwiched between Haggai and Malachi. Zechariah. And I encourage you this morning, there's, there's a lot of scripture that I want to bring in, and I encourage you to look it up with me and read it with me as we go through this passage of scripture. And if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew. But I encourage you to look it up because I want you to see it as well. So let's look at Zechariah, and I'm going to start with the last verse of chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2, and I'm going to start with the last verse, 13. The Word of God says, Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because He has roused Himself from His holy dwelling. Now, starting with chapter 3, Then He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I am going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? There are seven eyes on that one stone. And I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. And that, and that day each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Lord in heaven, we pray this morning that our hearts will be receptive to your word. Lord, we pray that we will have eyes to see and ears to hear by your Holy Spirit working in us this morning. Lord, open our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, 
as we look at this fourth out of eight visions in Zechariah, the third chapter. I want us to look. I wish we had time to spend more time with the whole book of Zechariah because there's so much richness in this book. If you've never read it, I encourage you to go and look at it and study it because this is not the Joshua of Exodus that we're familiar with. In fact, this high priest is found in Haggai 1.1. But the book of Zechariah foretold this coming of the Messiah in lowliness, in humanity, and his rejection and betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, his crucifixion, his priesthood, his kingship, his coming glory, his building of the Lord's temple, his reign, and his establishment of enduring peace and prosperity. We see all this in Zechariah. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture to read. Jesus referred to it in the New Testament. Look with me at Luke chapter 25. I'll try to give you time to get there. Luke chapter 25. And if you'll look at starting, I believe, in verse 25. We see here Jesus is on the road to Emmaus telling these two men on the way. And He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He said to them, this is what I told you while I still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. I'm sorry, my PowerPoint doesn't have all the scripture. That's why I'm asking you to look him up. But Jesus talked about the prophets and how all these things were going to be fulfilled. We have much to be thankful for this morning. Because I know that Joshua is representing a judicial setting here in this vision. And we too can put ourselves in the place of this fourth vision. That's what I hope you'll do this morning. But you say, Dan, we're not priests, are we? Well, look up 2 Peter or 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. You see, the first thing I want you to see in this text this morning in Zechariah is that like Joshua in this vision, Jesus is our high priest, but without sin. All our sin was poured out on Him. And I'm not sure that we realize this morning what Jesus accomplished on the cross. When he said, it is finished, God's wrath was poured out on his son to satisfy and to pay for and to take away our sin. Think about it. All of our sin was poured out and put on the perfect Lamb of God. I wonder this morning if we can imagine just for a minute what it was like in a small way of way he was trembling in that garden. Weeping and full of anguish because he knew, he knew what he was about to endure. The divine wrath of God, the Father. Listen to his words in Matthew 26. Verses 39. You're familiar with these passages, I'm sure. It says, My Father, 
If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. In anguish. The cup is not a reference to just a wooden cross. It's a reference to divine judgment. It's the cup of God's wrath. All God's holy wrath and hatred towards sin and sinners stored up since the beginning of creation of the world is about to be poured out on Him. And that is why He sweat blood at the thought of it. The thought of God the Father turning away because you could not bear to see your sin and my sin on His Son. I hear Christians sometimes say that they're lonely. And I think about Jesus. He experienced the loneliness at the deepest level when He was on the cross. Because His Father turned His back. You want to experience loneliness. That's loneliness. The second thing this morning I want you to see in this vision is we see Joshua the high priest and he's standing before the angel of the Lord and he is clothed in filthy garments. Joshua is not innocent here. His filthy garments give away who he is in God's presence. This isn't a courtroom to determine whether we're innocent or guilt. No, he's guilty and everybody knows it. And they can see his clothes. And his sin is obvious to everyone there. When we stand before God, we cannot hide our sin. Unless you're a child of the King. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13, we're all familiar with these scriptures. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from God's sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Everyone will stand before God and give an account. Only Jesus can take away our sin. There's no hiding our sin from Him. Sure, we can hide it from one another. But... He knows our heart. He knows where we're at. You have a big problem this morning if you go before God on your own merit. You see, we know all about John 3.16. We hear it quoted all over. Even in the world we see it. See it at games where they hold up John 3.16. But we don't see very many people hold up John 3.39. John 3.39 Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Look at with me in Revelation. Let's look at another courtroom. Revelation chapter 20. See, you don't want to find yourself here. Because if you die without Christ, this is where you're going to be in Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. 
And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in to the lake of fire. Look back at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Starting with verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed of My Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now I'll move forward just a little bit farther to verse 41. Matthew 25. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Man, I want to tell you this morning that you don't have to suffer God's wrath because He came to rescue us from our sin. God provided a way for you this morning. If you don't belong to Him, if you've never trusted Him, I pray that this morning the Holy Spirit will convict you and that you won't leave here without Him. I see a struggle sometimes with believers and even unbelievers alike. Some unbelievers don't trust God because they don't think He can forgive what they have done. And some believers don't trust that He has forgiven them. Oh, here's another passage we need to look at. If you'll look with me at Luke Go to Luke chapter 16. This might be the most gut-wrenching passage, especially if you're not a believer in Christ. Luke chapter 16. Look at starting with verse 19. He says, Now there was a certain rich man And he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now it came about that the poor man died and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades he lifted up his eyes being in torment and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. This may be the greatest message from a non-Christian. As we read on, he, he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. 
But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone even rises from the dead. Oh, folks, this is a parable Jesus told. But there's truth in this because hell is a real place. Jesus talked about hell more than anyone else in the Scripture. Why did He tell us about it? Because He doesn't want us to go there. His mercy is reaching out to us saying, Don't! I wonder if that rich man could talk to us this morning. I wonder what he would say. I think he'd say, Don't come here. Hell is real. We don't talk about it much in our pulpits. We don't hear it a lot. But we ought to be thinking about those that have never come to Christ. They're going to go there if they don't turn to Christ. The third thing I want you to look in this passage this morning is we see in this vision an accuser. And he's standing at his right side. Satan is ready to accuse Joshua before the Lord. I remember working in corrections, and we had, I'm probably not to say too much about those things we did, but I'll just say there was this book of rules. And if someone broke the rules, you wrote, you wrote, a, wrote them up. And you'd use the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why, if you knew why they did it. And you would go and you would stand and you'd go into a room and there would be a hearing officer and he would read your report. And I didn't do a very good job writing a report sometimes. And he would determine whether this person had done this or not. And they would always base it on whether 51%. If he could think that this person probably did it, 51%, he found him guilty. But if he didn't do a good job writing it up, he'd throw it out. But this isn't that kind of court. See, Joshua is guilty, and everybody knows it. You and I are guilty standing before God in dirty garments. But the best part of this whole vision, the best part has noticed that the angel of the Lord and people way smarter than me say that this is Jesus in this vision. And when you go back in the Old Testament, you can find other places where the angel of the Lord was Jesus. Abraham was visited by Jesus. And there's other passages. The best part of this whole vision was Jesus. And he, before the adversary could even bring one accusation, the Lord steps in and says, Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no. This one's mine. Not one accusation. That's great news. You see, Satan never is able to bring one accusation. And if you've been forgiven this morning, you have more to be thankful for than anyone it's interesting this morning that we're going to do the communion. What a great day to do that as a believer in Christ and to remember what He's done for us at the cross. Satan, who is a hater of our soul, who stands against us in spiritual battle, he can't bring one accusation against you. Because the Lord steps in on our behalf. Not just our behalf, but our, our place. Look at another passage with me in Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Notice that he says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. It's going to come a day. when he can't do that. 
starting with verse 9. Look at Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and the angels were thrown down with him. And his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before God day and night. And they overcome him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. Folks, Satan, until God casts him out, he's accusing day and night. Notice in this text this morning in Zechariah that the Satan is about to point to Joshua's clothes, his filthy garments, which point to his sinful condition that everybody can see. Folks, God sees all our sin. But the angel of the Lord said, Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? How much is a stick worth? That is burned in the fire. He is blackened, a charred chunk of wood smoking in the ashes. If it isn't plucked from the fire, it will be consumed completely. I like what Spurgeon wrote about this. Quote, he says, So it is with the child of God. What is he at best till he is taken up to heaven? He is nothing but a brand plucked out of the fire. It is his daily moan that he is a sinner. But Christ accepts him as he is, and he shuts the devil's mouth by telling him, Thou sayest this man is a black? Of course he is. What did I think he was but that? He is a brand plucked out of the fire. I plucked him out of it. He was burning when he was in it. He is black now. He is out of it. He was what I knew he would be. He is not what I mean to make him. But he is what I knew he would be. I have chosen him as a brand plucked out of the fire. What is thou to say to that? End quote. I want you to notice Joshua did not add a single word. How could he? He stands guilty before God. And neither can you and I have anything that we can add or say. Because God has done it all. We too are a burning stick in the fire to be consumed until our Lord stepped in on our behalf. Are you thankful this morning for what the Lord has done for you? The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Let me me ask you something. Do you throw a dead person, a life preserver? What good is that going to do him? He's dead. A life preserver is for someone that's still alive. They may be drowning, but they're still alive. No. You don't throw a dead person a life preserver. A dead person needs to be brought to life. A person that is dead spiritually needs spiritual CPR. We need to be resurrected, rescued. That's what Jesus came to do, is to give us new life. It's false thinking today when we hear we just need a little Jesus help in our life. No, we need Him desperately. We need new life. The fourth thing I want you to notice this morning in this passage is the command. There's a command in this passage from the Lord that says, take away his filthy garments. Do you know what that filthy word in the Hebrew language, the strongest expression, the most vile, the most loathsome of character, There's words you can use to describe that, but you can imagine what they are. 
Look at Isaiah 64. I know you're familiar with these passages, but look at Isaiah 64, starting with verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garment. Filthy! And all of us wither like a leaf in our iniquities, like the wind take us away. Folks, that's the best you can do with your righteousness is to be in filthy rags. That's the best we can do. Filthy rags. But the Lord says, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. Wow. That's a good trade. Filthy rags for rich robes. What kind of clothes do you think God will dress you with? Do you think it's going to be some like cheap department store brand? There's nothing cheap anymore, is there? Go to Kohl's and you go, wow, I can't afford this. But every time you wash that cloth, and every time you wear it, what happens? It starts fading. And sometimes they'll start ripping. They don't last. But these garments, they're going to last. I don't think so. They're going to last forever. The best clothes you have ever known. You're going to look good in these new duds. Amen? They're going to be comfortable. They're going to wear. They're going to fit you. Just think for a minute about being clothed by God. Wrap your brain around that one. Now, there's clothes that we need to wear until that time when we'll be freed from our old self. In Ephesians, it tells us to put on the full armor of God. Why does it tell us to do that? Because we're at war. There's an enemy, and he's firing fiery arrows at us, trying to make us fall. That's the kind of clothes we need on right now. The fifth thing this morning I want you to notice is the admonishment from jo- to, from a promise to Joshua. See, there's a condition in this scripture. Joshua's future service to God. Notice that the Lord tells Joshua that if you walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you, will, you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Look at the similarity of the other Joshua that we're so familiar with. The Joshua that was with Moses that took them into the promised land. Joshua 1.7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Now, we can misquote that verse because, see, a lot of times we take verses and we say, oh, well, that means I can have a guaranteed trouble-free life. That's not what the Scripture says at all. You see, we look at this and we think, do we just obey some of these? Is obedience optional? with God I read a book by David Platt it was called Radical and he wrote this in here I quote it from him we take Jesus command in Matthew 28 to make disciples of all nations and we say that means other people But we look at Jesus' command in Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And we say, now that means me. We take Jesus' promise in Acts 1, 8. 
that the Spirit will lead us to the ends of the earth, and we say, that means some people. But we take Jesus' promise in John 10, 10, that says we will have abundant life, and we say, oh, that's for me. So many, how many of us have drawn a line of distinction assigning the obligations of Christianity to a few while keeping the privileges of Christianity for us all? Ouch, the end of quote. Is our obedience to God optional? The final thing this morning I want you to look at is the prophetic message of the Messiah and His reign. It's all here. Notice that the branch mentioned in verse 8 is a title for the Messiah. And you can find that in Isaiah 4.2 and Isaiah 11.1. Jeremiah 23.5 and Jeremiah 33.15. The branch is associated with fruitfulness and life. Jesus said that He is the vine and we are the branches in John 15.5. We see the stone mentioned in verse 9. And upon the stone are seven eyes. The eyes represent knowledge because we learn more through our eyes than any other way. The seven eyes speak of the perfection and fullness of the knowledge and wisdom of the Messiah. And the Lord will remove the sin of this land in one day. Folks, that was fulfilled. Jesus came and fulfilled taking away all those who believe in Him. Their sin forevermore. That's good news. We have so much to be thankful for. And the last one mentioned in Zechariah, the peace that the Messiah will bring is in verse 10. When everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree, when we are washed and have new garments, we'll be the Lord forever. We'll be with him forever. And our clothes aren't going to wear out. Oh, what a powerful passage of Scripture that we can put ourselves in. But do we realize that there's a real hell Do we realize that there's people dying around us that don't know Christ? I wonder this morning if we realize what Jesus did for us to the level that we should start realizing if we don't as we take of the Lord's Supper this morning. I wonder if we realize the sacrifice He made for us. And not just the sacrifice. Look at this verse in Hebrews chapter 4. I promise I'm almost done. Hebrews chapter 4. We're all familiar with these passages, but what great passages they are. Starting with verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. That's good news. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have much to be thankful for. He promises to help us in our time of need. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we need Him in our time of testing. He knows what it's like to be tempted. I don't know about you, but there should be a time in your life When you remember putting yourself in this vision, when you knew that you were wearing filthy rags, and you knew you were standing before God and God was convicting you of your sin, and Jesus stepped in and said, You're mine. 
and you confessed your sins and you said, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin and you gave your life to him and he came in and he changed your life. You're going to know. It's not just a prayer that saves you. But what happens after that? Has he been working in your life? Have you noticed him moving in and changing your heart since you've been saved? Do you have a holy desire to please him and to walk with him? See, those are all evidences that God is living in your heart. But if you don't have those, you need to be sure. You need to know. And if you're not sure, this is the time to make it. finished I wonder this morning as we get ready to close and we get ready to take communion I wonder if the Holy Spirit is working on your heart this morning I can't believe that there's not someone here that God is speaking to you see you don't want to leave the same way you came If God is speaking to your heart, you might not have another opportunity. Every time we turn around, someone is going into eternity. We don't know when it's our turn. We don't know when it's our time. But we want to be ready. Don't leave here the same way. There's warnings all over Scripture about not listening and not listening to what God's saying and not being obedient. I'm thinking of a scripture in Hebrews as well, chapter 2, verse 3. It says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. You see, we hear the scripture, and the Holy Spirit uses that to speak to our hearts. But there's a danger in not responding to God. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing the words of the Lord. Folks, that's devastating because if we can't hear God's word, we can't be saved. This morning, I don't know what God's saying to you. All I know is that he doesn't desire that anyone perish. And I pray this morning that you'll not leave here, that you'll grab Pastor Jake this morning and say, I want to know for sure that you won't leave here until you talk to one of the elders. Pull him aside. I want to know for sure. If God's working on your heart, respond to what he's saying to you this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning, I thank you for your word. Thank you for how powerful it is. The word of God is living and active. It penetrates our hearts, our hard hearts. Lord, I pray that your work would be done. Only you can do it. Lord, we trust you this morning. And as we close and as we take communion, I pray, oh Lord, that you'll help us to do business with you that we need to do. Maybe we've been walking away. Maybe we haven't been following you like we should. Lord, we need to repent. We need to confess and that you'll forgive us for our sin. Lord, maybe we've never put our trust in you. Maybe someone here has never put their trust in you. I pray this morning that, Lord, that you'll convict their heart. And that they'll confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that you raised them from the dead. That you, you were raised from the dead. 
This morning, I pray that you would be glorified. And it's all in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.